I don't know about you, but um, every time that I'm, I'm driving and I face that, I come across that beautiful traffic sign called Yield, uh, something inside me, uh, when I'm approaching the merge point, I want to get there before uh, the next driver, right? Something inside me uh, makes me uh, uh, think, can I get there before that other driver? Is there any way in this world that will uh, uh, help me, something that will help me get there before that nasty driver? Is there anything that I can do uh, so that I will get there before him so that I will not submit to that person and give that person the right away. That's what happens to me. Maybe I am the nasty driver. That's what happens to me every time when I am merging on to 75 every day, every morning. I'm trying to beat the other driver to it. I want to place myself first. If it is a stop sign, that's one thing, right? Because a stop sign, you've got to stop regardless, whether there's somebody coming or not. Uh, now, when it comes to the yield sign... Well, if nobody's coming, then I just keep on rolling, right? If there is somebody coming, then I keep on rolling faster so I can place myself before that person. Again, maybe I am the nasty driver. We come today to the end of our series on prayer, Real Conversations with the Real God. Um, and I am, uh, again, challenged by the concept of submission so we come to the end of this series, but to yet another difficult and challenging principle, the principle of submission. I am afraid that my prayer life sometimes reflects my attitude as a driver. Perhaps to my dismay, this yield sign will always be in front of me throughout my entire spiritual journeys throughout my entire prayer life. There will never be a moment in my life when I pray that this yield sign will not be in front of me. I will never get past that sign. I will always be staring at God's command to submit myself to His will, to allow His will to come first. The truth of the matter is that prayer requires humility, right? And Dave did mention that last week. Prayer and humility, they go hand in hand. Whenever we approach God in prayer, our attitude should not be of somebody who's holding things tightly. My dreams, my desires, my plans. I need to approach God in prayer with my hands open ready to do what God has designed and wants me to do. I never cease to be amazed at Jesus. His utter disposition to humbly and completely submit, submit himself to the will of the Father. I mean, for Jesus, he said so. My food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to accomplish his work. John 4.34, basically Jesus said, I, I have set aside my will to do the will of the Father. Think especially of that moment in the Garden of Gethsemane. Just a few hours, perhaps minutes actually, minutes before Jesus is arrested, taken into custody uh, to be tried. Matthew 26, 36, he, he says to his disciples, three of them, stay here for a little bit while I'm going to go over there and pray because my soul is in deep distress, even to the point of death. And what did Jesus do? He prayed not only once, but three times. And he prayed not only once, but three times the same prayer. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. At a moment of extreme agony, of deep anguish, when Jesus strongly felt the pull of human weakness, 
He remained resolute in his decision to submit himself to the will of the Father. As a preacher said, he who made atonement for the sins of mankind submitted himself in a garden of suffering to the will of God from which man had revolted in a garden of pleasure. Jesus knew that the only way to atone for your sins and my sins would be by becoming a man and operating within the limitations of human boundaries, suffering, dying, and being separated from the Father. There was no alternative. So that's what Jesus did. No wonder there is a whole hymn in the scripture, right, exalting Jesus Christ, who although existed in the form of God, he did not consider equality with God something he should grasp. But he emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave and being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, Philippians 2. And Jesus says now, I humbly submitted to the Father so that God's plan would be fulfilled and I call you to do the same. If you and I want to uh, participate, join in God's agenda, participate in God's plan, then we also must submit to the will of the Father. Now, I want to focus our attention for the most part today not on the final hours of Jesus' public ministry, but in the, on the very beginning of his ministry. So I invite you to open your Bible to Matthew 3. We will go over a few verses in Matthew 3 and 4. Uh, we'll make some observations uh, on those two chapters. And already at the outset of Jesus' public ministry, he demonstrates willingness to fulfill God's plans by submitting to God's will in unthinkable ways. In ways that highlight Jesus' humility. That humility that permeated his whole life, his whole ministry. From the very beginning of the ministry to the very end, as we just mentioned. And in the process, Jesus teaches us that the believer can only effectively participate in God's plans by completely submitting to God's will. If you're going to walk away today with something, I hope it's this. The believer, you and I, can only effectively participate in God's plans by completely submitting to God's will. And here, Matthew 3 and 4, Jesus displays his humble submission to the Father in four ways. The first one is that Jesus submitted himself to someone whose authority was infinitely lower than his. He submitted himself to the authority of someone whose, uh, whose authority was infinitely lower than his. So check chapter 3 of, uh, of Matthew. In those days, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children of Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. 
But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. What a message. I wonder what would happen if we, if we tried this kind of preaching nowadays. But Jesus is submit, we'll see that Jesus submits himself to the authority of John the Baptist. Um, what was the mission of John the Baptist? We see that plainly in the text. He came to do one thing and one thing only. Prepare the way of the Messiah. To fulfill the prophecy, the Messiah is coming, but we need somebody to make the paths straight for the Messiah. To tell the people, hey, the Messiah is coming, so it's time for you to repent from your sins. Because the kingdom of God is here. He was not the Messiah. He is not the Lord. He's just preparing the way for the Lord. That was his mission. It's interesting that in John, we read that John the, John the Baptist understood quite well his position. He never tried to usurp the Messiah's position. He said, it's, it's time for the Messiah to increase and for me to decrease. His, his, mission, his ministry is, is rather short. He, is, he exists for a while. He operates, especially in the Judean desert, calling people to repentance. And as soon as Jesus comes into scene, John fades away. He's arrested and killed. That's it. That was his mission. He was not the Messiah. He was not the Lord. And the ministry of John the Baptist, we see, that was water baptism for repentance. He had no authority beyond the symbolism of water baptism. Now contrast John with Jesus. So John exists to glorify God with a short ministry, prepare sinners for the coming Messiah. Jesus is the Lord whose ways John is preparing. John baptizes with water so people can repent from their sins. Jesus is the one effecting repentance for salvation. And he's the one who gives people the gift of the Holy Spirit. John tells people, we are not part of, God, of the family of God. Jesus is the one who introduces people in the family of God. John tells people, you are not part of the family of God. And Jesus is the one who casts those people into unquenchable fire if they don't repent. So in his humility, Jesus placed himself under the authority of someone who occupied a much lower position than his. And that's because God's redemption plan is unfolding. And Jesus is part of that plan. Second, Jesus identified himself with sinners. Sinners who needed to repent from their sins in order to avoid condemnation. So keep reading chapter 3, verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And now do you come to me? But Jesus answered to him, Let it be so now, for thus is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Now look at the people that John was baptizing, right? Look at the type of people. Verses 5 and 6. These are arrogant sinners. We just read it. People coming from all over Judea, all, uh, uh, from all the region around in Jerusalem. Some of them were saying, well, we are sons of Abraham already. Why do we have to undergo this prophet's authority? Submit to his authority. So these are arrogant sinners. Verse 7, John tells that 
they are fleeing from the wrath of God. So they're sinners under the wrath of God. Not a very popular concept. You are under the wrath of God. Verse 8, these are also sinners who naturally and of themselves are unable to live righteous lives and produce righteous fruit. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And verse 9, people who do not belong to the family of God. So these are arrogant sinners who were objects of the wrath of God, unable to produce fruits of righteousness, and who do not belong in the family of God. These are the people that John is baptizing. What do these people do? Verses 5, 6, and verse 8. They are seeking repentance, and they confess and repent from their sins. Now in verse 13, what we have is that Jesus comes to be baptized. Remember, nobody, nobody knew who Jesus was except John. So for all that's worth, Jesus is just another run-of-the-mill Jewish man who is an arrogant sinner, right? Under God's wrath, incapable of doing good works, and who does not belong to the family of God. No one knows who Jesus is except John. So everybody looks around at each other and say, we are all the same. What are we doing here? Oh, I'm here to repent for my sins. John the Baptist, he's a prophet of God. Well, do we sh should we really repent from our sins? We are sons of Abraham. So they would look at Jesus and think that he was just another man like you and, and, and me. But Jesus humbly comes in the mix. God in the flesh. Identify himself with sinners. He who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, mixed with sinners. He in whom all fullness of God was pleased to dwell, mixed with sinners. He in whom all the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, mixed with sinners. He whom God appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world, mixed with sinners. He who is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact imprint of his nature mixed with sinners. He who upholds the universe by the word of his power mixed with sinners. Jesus Christ humbly submitted to the will of the Father by identifying himself with you and with me, wicked people. He wasn't forced to do that. He said so himself, I willingly do this to carry out God's plan. So we can only effectively participate in God's plans by completely submitting to God's will. That's what Jesus is showing. It, does, it doesn't stop there. If, if you ignore the chapter division and keep moving to chapter 4, you see in third place that Jesus submitted himself to the laws of human nature. We read in verse uh, 2 of chapter 4, that Jesus was fasting and he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, then Jesus was hungry. God was hungry. Have you thought about that? God was hungry. After 40 days without food, Jesus is hungry. God decided to submit himself to the natural laws of life that he himself had established. He who laid the foundation and determined the measurements of the earth was hungry. He who prescribed how far the seas should go was hungry. He who hangs the stars and gives source to the light of the sun was hungry. He who knows every corner of the deep oceans was hungry. He who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry to God for help and wonder about for lack of food. He was hungry. The God of the universe was hungry. And this was just the beginning, 
the first few days of Jesus' public ministry, there were thousands of instances when Jesus, from his birth to his, to his death, Jesus, when, that Jesus acted within the boundaries of fallen humanity, willingly. And thanks be to God, because we needed a human Savior. Jesus submitted to, to all this to fulfill God's plan. Finally, Jesus submitted himself to be targeted by the evil schemes of the devil. Jesus submitted himself to be targeted by the evil schemes of the devil. And of course, we read in chapter 4 now that he's in the desert. And uh, the devil comes to him in, in verse 3 of chapter 4 and tells him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And then verse 5, the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are really the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it's written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And verse 8, again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And, and Satan told him, All these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. And according to Luke 4.13, the devil left Jesus after the temptation only to come back later when he had another opportunity, another chance to tempt Jesus. Why was Jesus tempted? His, why is he submitting himself now to this aspect of human life, to temptation? Well, we, we don't have to go too far. We just need to read the Bible and, and find in, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, you and I. So Jesus also himself likewise partook of the same things. That through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abram. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So in other words, the plan of God for your salvation, for my salvation, involved the Savior being tempted in all things. Propitiation of sins is only possible because Jesus was tempted. And while tempted, he resisted temptation and showed that he is the perfect Lamb of God, apt to be the sacrifice of God. That's why he was tempted throughout his life. Now also in Hebrews 4 now, 14 we read, Since then we have our great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That is, Christ was tempted just like you and me so that God can sympathize with us in our own weaknesses. This means, my beloved, this means that Jesus, Jesus, he gets you. Jesus understands you. This is great news. You might, you might be thinking, hey, what I'm going through right now, you know, nobody in my family has gone through this. None of my friends has gone through this before. <laughs> my church, my church is small. They, they don't have the capacity to, to help me with this. I don't know of anybody in the church who went through the same problem. 
till no one gets me. Not true. Jesus does. And he is always ready, always ready to embrace you, to welcome you, to extend his arms and give you mercy, give you grace, because he went through everything that we go through. There is no excuse for the believer to think that no one gets him or her. There is hope. There is hope in Jesus. Jesus submitted himself to the same demonic attacks, to the same depression that you and I experience. Look at him in the garden. He was targeted with the same things that we are to fulfill God's plan. So my beloved, in the case of Jesus, accepting and following the will of God, of the Father, for his life, it meant that Jesus had to submit himself to someone whose authority was infinitely lower than his had to identify himself with sinners, people he did not belong in, th in the middle of them. He had to submit himself to the laws of human nature, being himself the crea creator of nature and all the laws, and had to become the target of the evil schemes of the devil. You might be thinking, ha, that's, easy. That, that's Jesus, right? He's God after all. And that, I, I guess that, that's one of the issues that we in general, even myself growing up, we tend perhaps to overemphasize the deity of Jesus and detriment to his humanity. Jesus was a man. And how was Jesus able to submit to God's will to this extent as a man? We don't have to get into the theological weeds of hypostatic union and the two natures of, of Jesus, the divine nature and the human nature. That's mystery. That's too complicated for us. We just need to understand that he was a man. Without sin, but a man. Which means that what he had at his disposal is also available to the rest of mankind. So how did Jesus, how did Jesus submit to God to this extent? Well, in chapter 3 of Matthew, verses 13 to 15, we read that Jesus comes to be baptized. And in verse 14, John tries to prevent him by saying, I need to be baptized by you, but you come to me? What is Jesus' answer? Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So Jesus was able to submit himself to the Father's will to this extent first, because Jesus had an eternal perspective. Jesus had an eternal perspective. He was not focused on who he was or who he is. He doesn't look at John and say, yeah, you were right, John. I'm, I'm God after all. Who are you? I mean, I was in the womb of my mother. You were in the womb of your mother. And you were already worshiping me. Remember that? When, Elizabeth, when Mary came to visit Elizabeth and baby John inside Elizabeth leaped. Yeah. Messiah's coming. Jesus could have said, yeah, I am the authority, the final authority. I should be the one baptizing everybody over here. But no. He said, John, I will submit to your authority because there is something greater than me. There is something greater than my credentials. There is something greater than my ontology or my being over here. There is something greater than my position and, and my fame. There is the righteousness of God. 
which needs to be fulfilled. When we have an eternal perspective, when we do not focus on our own selves, our own situation, our own belly, yeah, we can start thinking about submitting to God's will. Jesus had an eternal perspective. Second, we read still in chapter 3. When he comes out of the water, the heavens open, and the Spirit of God is descending like a dove and coming to rest on Jesus. And then God the Father says, Behold, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And then chapter 4, verse 1. Ignore the big number four. Keep reading. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Second, Jesus had an infallible guide. Jesus had an infallible guide, the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is being baptized by John. He comes out of the water. And then God reassures Jesus and John, this is my son, this is my beloved son. Now he has received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is poured over Jesus. From now on, throughout his whole public ministry, about three years, every single deed, every single teaching, Every miracle that he performs is under the power and authority and direction of the Holy Spirit. He is the par excellence example of somebody, a son of God, who lives by the power and under the complete influence of the Holy Spirit. That's why the apostles issued the same command. Do not fill yourselves with wine, but be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Who is the par excellence example? Jesus. And you know, he was just proven to John. He's just received this reassuring word from the Father. So Jesus is ready to launch into his ministry all over the land. I mean, he's ready to go into the courts of kings, to go into the authorities, to go into uh, the praetors and Roman uh, uh, governors and tell them about this gospel, that the kingdom of God is here. He's ready to go to the slums and talk to the tax collectors and prostitutes that the gospel is here, the kingdom is here. He is ready to have this mountaintop experience of ministry. Right? Well, that's what we would expect of someone who lives empowered by the Holy Spirit the whole time. Someone who obeys God in everything. He or she got to be in the center of God's will. They're going to be blessed. It's going to be success all over. And then we read in verse 1, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. To the desert. To be tempted by the devil. How paradoxical that might sound to you and me. How anticlimactic that sounds. He had an infallible guide. He was the son of God, just vindicated, vindicated, just proven right, just proven to be the son of God. And the spirit of God leads him to will to the wilderness, to suffer. Our problem is that we, we connect a life controlled by the spirit with only success and success from our human perspective. That's why we're shocked when we read this contrast. Think of Paul. Saul is converted by God, by Christ, in that amazing experience in the, on the road to Damascus. 
And then God, Jesus tells him, hey, Paul, guess what? I've chosen you. There's no, no chance for you. There's no, it's not worth resisting. I'm going to use you, whether you like it or not. So you better get used to it. What happens to Paul? Is he sent straight away to the, to the Gentiles? Does he go straight away to Caesar or to Felix or to Philippi or to Rome? No, he goes to the desert in Arabia, to the desert to learn from Christ, to receive revelation from Christ under the guidance of the same Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, which we have, God himself in us, he leads us to deserts and through deserts as well. Don't be mistaken. But most important, in the process, we are helping, we are contributing to God's plan, to something far beyond ourselves. Something far greater than 80 years of life that we get to live over here. Finally, Jesus, how was he able to do all this? To submit to God's will this way? Well, he had an internal perspective, an infallible guide, and Jesus had the most powerful weapon. In chapter 4, three temptations. We all perhaps know this. Three temptations, three times he's tempted by the devil. And he responds every single time by quoting scripture. Verse 4, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Verse 7, it's written again, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And verse 10, be gone, Satan, for it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. It is written, it is written, and it is written. And guess where it's written? In Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. He's not even quoting, you know, Genesis or Exodus or Psalms. One of the pro Deuteronomy. There is power in Deuteronomy too, if you haven't used it for your devotion. Uh, my former pastor would joke and say, I wonder how successful we would be in our own temptations if all we had was the book of Deuteronomy. How many verses can we quote besides these three, perhaps? But Jesus used these resources, the books of the Bible, Scripture, to defeat Satan himself, a powerful being. We like to think that we are tempted by Satan all the time, and guess what? We're not. If you read James, we are enticed by our own sinful flesh. I'm not saying we're not tempted by the devil. We are too. But we like to give credit to the devil more than he's due. So if Jesus was able to defeat Satan himself, a powerful being with the word of God, we have the same weapon, weapon at, at our disposal now to defeat our own sinful flesh. And, what, and the devil too when he comes around. It's reassuring once again. It gives us hope. Hope. Right? Right? When we see that Jesus, the man, he had these three things. With these three things, he was able to submit himself to the Father and fulfill God's will and God's plan. Eternal perspective, we can have that too. We can and we should develop that as well. Infallible guide, we also have the Holy Spirit. And we have the Word of God. There's nothing should stop us from acting like Jesus. 
We will never submit to God's will and effectively participate in God's plan if we live for this life, enticed by this world and seeking pleasures of this earth. If we follow a guide other than the Holy Spirit living in us, perhaps a life coach that you like, who will teach you how to live. Really? And we'll never submit to God's will and effectively participate in His plans if we don't use the Word of God, our most powerful weapon. Now, in conclusion, I would like to bookend our time together by going back to the Garden of Gethsemane, to the final hours, final day, final hours of Jesus' public ministry. You can go back over there mentally. If you, if you want to go back there in Scripture, Matthew 26, 36. But go back there. Because I, I, very briefly, would like to help you answer one question that Jesus experienced, that Jesus wrestled with. And that question is, what do we do when God's will hurts? I was talking to a co-worker of mine. He was living an awesome life in North Carolina, engineer, living the dream life, I guess. I mean, he was, you know, up and going in his career, very successful as an engineer, making good money, uh, had a wife, kids, bought a house, you know, the dog and everything. It was all good. Serving in the church, faithful, good friends, actively involved. And one day he started, you know, feeling this stirring in his heart. And that went on for a while, and he eventually talked to the pastor, and the pastor said, you know, perhaps God is, is giving you a tug to go to ministry. Pray about it. And sure enough, he prayed about it, and again, he was a successful engineer, had a very comfortable life, but God called him to ministry. And he talked to his wife. He went on to seminary, took several classes over there, and they finally decided to move to Dallas to finish his degree at DTS, Dallas Theological Seminary. And then they moved over here. Shortly after he started taking classes, his marriage is destroyed. His wife is unfaithful to him, not only once, but twice in crude ways. His marriage is over. His family shattered. Never able to pastor a church. Does not practice his engineering uh, job anymore. He's happy where he is now, but the question he had to wrestle with the most I was talking to him the other day. He said, you know what? The most difficult question was, God, why? Because I was okay. And then you called me to ministry. I answered. I obeyed you. This is your will. Why? To get past that is the trouble. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, we find Jesus in deep agony as well. He's wrestling with the will of God. And in practical ways, God's will for Jesus will cause him much pain and loss. While talking about this passage, a, a, a pastor highlighted three perceptive lessons that I would like to share with you right now. These precious les lessons emerge from Gethsemane. And I, I hope that they will help you as you go through your own Gethsemane. Times of anguish and agony with the will of God. So first lesson was intimacy with God does not exclude the possibility of pain. 
Intimacy with God does not exclude the possibility of pain. The first thing that we do when we suffer or when some, someone else suffers is to question his or her spiritual life. We, we question our own standing with God. Are, are we obey, am I obeying God? Am I failing God here and there? Jesus, the Son of God. So there's no degree of intimacy as close as that enjoyed by the three persons of the triune God. Right? Jesus, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Father, God the Father, they enjoy an intimacy that we do not. And He, He was going through pain. Cast yourself in the arms of God in moments like these. Instead of start questioning your position with God, your position with Christ. You might have a wonderful intimate life with the Lord and still experience pain. Second, as we struggle with the will of God, the best resource at our disposal is prayer. Jesus prayed not only once, but three times. Temptation, go to the Word of God, it's great. I'm not saying you should not pray, pray too, but using Jesus' own example. He used the Bible to fight off temptation, and he used prayer to fight off his weakness. And, you know, that moment when he was struggling with the will of God, do that. And third, Jesus prayed three times. Every single time, if it is possible, Lord, pass this cup, this separation that I'm going to have from you, carrying the load of sin over my shoulder, undergoing all the physical pain. If possible at all, God, pass this for me. But if not, may your will be done. He prayed that three times. Once he was done, what did he say to the disciples? Get up and let's get going because the hour has come. So he prayed those three times. And now is the third lesson. Not so much that he would change God's will, but that he would be changed by God. So we pray not so much to change God, but so that God will change us. Keep these in, in mind. Follow Jesus' example in this. And submit to God's will, even if it's, un, if it's unpleasant. We find hope in Jesus. He did it. And by his power, by his grace and mercy, we can too.